God is doing some great things, amen? amen? And I'm excited about the season that we're in, focus on the future. Uh, we're going to be talking over the next few weeks, as I, as I shared with you last week, about the importance in us investing and, and leaving a, a legacy and an inheritance to a generation. I'm thankful for this church. Uh, Nicole and I are about to celebrate one year of ministry here at Heritage. And amen. Thank you. And we're one of the things that we recognized in coming here is that there's a great foundation and we just have the opportunity to build upon a foundation that has been laid. There's been an inheritance that has been left for us as a body of believers today. Uh, many of you have been a part of this church for many, many years. You have been a part of sowing so that this building that we're in today can be built. You've been a part of uh, teaching and, and discipling and doing missions so that people would be saved. And so we're excited about the future of Heritage. We're excited to be a part of what God is doing here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. We're excited to stand and honored to stand on this platform. So we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about the importance of keeping that legacy and that inheritance going. It's not that the rest of us are less important, but we believe that we have a responsibility to train up a child. Amen? Um, if we don't, somebody else will. And so that's the series that we're in. And oftentimes we, we ask the question, how do we reap the harvest? We ask the question of how do we leave that spiritual inheritance for our children? And so in thinking along those lines this morning, I've titled this message, The Answer is Longevity. The Answer is so that question is longevity. One of my f definitions I like most about the word longevity is length of service. Length of service. Many of you have received promotions in your jobs because of your longevity. Because you have served the company great for so long, there's been a reward that's come to you to help you advance in that company. Some of you have been rewarded jobs with other companies because of your longevity with a previous employer. Because you did not give up and you moved through the hard times, you were willing to adjust when adjustment was needed, you were willing to stretch when stretching was taking place, and because of your longevity, because of your faithfulness, because of your service, you've received Promotions. Everybody say promotions. Our hope for the future of the church is that we always invest into the next generation. I'm thankful that we stand as the New Testament church today because somebody that walked with Jesus did not give up on the gospel message when Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. I'm thankful that there were those that would continue to preach and teach and disciple so that here, over 2,000 years later, we could stand as the New Testament church with a relationship in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you thankful that somebody has preached that message so that you heard the gospel? Amen? The gospel message has been preached from generation to generation. The story has been told. We're able to read it. And we always have to be looking at the next generation to pass the mantle and to invest in. We believe that heritage is about that, leaving an inheritance for the next generation. We believe that the word fellowship in our name is so that we can create opportunities for the body of Christ to connect together. And so the focus on the future is our step in that direction to do so. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number one i'm going to read two verses of scripture to you out of the new living translation if you do not have your bibles we've placed it on the screen for you this morning second timothy chapter one begin with verse nine reads like this for god saved us and called us to live a holy life he did this not because we deserved it but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Are you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. And now, somebody say now. 
Now he has made us all, he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Are you thankful that your Savior broke death, hell, and the grave, also that you could live a free life in the freedom of Jesus? Amen. Also that through the good news, the good news of the gospel, the gospel that we still preach today and teach today, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Our responsibility is to share this exact message of, of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Our responsibility as the body of Christ is to share that gospel message. That there was a savior that went to a cross and gave his life. He broke the, the, the powers of, of, of death and he showed us the way to new life through resurrection power. We do not serve a dead savior on a cross. We do not serve a baby in a manger. We serve a risen king, a risen savior that sits at the right hand of the heavenly father is forever interceding on our behalf. That's who we serve this morning. You can't find him in a tomb. You can't find him in a grave. You can't go see him in a museum. Why? Because he is alive and he is well and he is still saving his people. And as long as we preach and teach the gospel that Jesus died and he rose again and he offers salvation through, through that, then the church will prevail. Amen. The church will go forward. We believe that it's our responsibility to share that message, especially into our children especially into our children. Today, there is a lot of information being given to our children at a young age. And we feel that it's, there's no better time than the present to, to disciple and raise up children. Amen? I always knew this. I, many of you know, I mean, I was a youth pastor. I've served in many different roles in church. And I always knew that children follow the example of the adults, the adults in front of them. I've really learned this being a father. Just a little example. Yes, yesterday, there, there in the, the benefit that we had here, um, you know, we had some certain parts of the building roped off. We had the lobby open. Um, but the, the wing going down to our, our offices, we, we had that roped off where not just anybody could walk down there. And so I had to run back to my office, you know, a few times throughout the day. And I would, and I would run and I would just duck under the rope. Y'all like that, don't you? Just got to duck under it. I was never good at limbo, so I don't go backwards. I go forward. And Lexi and Colson would be with me oftentimes. And at one moment, Jewel and I were walking down the hallway. And I, and I go, and I'm just walking. I'm not even thinking about it. And I, I duck under the rope, and I keep on walking. And Lexi, she was just barely tall enough where her head would hit it. So she would just duck under, and she'd keep walking. And Joel starts laughing. He says, hey, Pastor, did you see Colson? And I said, why? And, and Colson, you know, Colson's only this tall. Well, the rope was up here. But because everybody in front of him ducked, when Colson would get to the rope, he'd go. <laughs> and then he'd keep walking. He didn't have to, but he was just following that was what was in front of him. He was just modeling what he saw in front of him. He trusts his dad. And most of the time he trusts his sister. But all he was doing was, I don't know why I'm ducking yet, but I just know everybody else is doing it, so I have to do it. That is the impression that we get to place into a child at such a young, tender age. Because when they're not in our care, there's a world that's modeling things before them that says, don't worry about why you do it, just do what I do. Just, fo just follow me. And so therefore, the church has to make sure that we are ever keeping progression and modeling what it is to worship. Modeling what it is to pray. Modeling what it is to read the word of God. Modeling what it is to know the word. Modeling what it is to let a child know that there was a savior that broke the power of death and has illuminated life. And they can live in that. A savior that has called us to live a holy life. 
a savior that will be there in the good times and the bad. And his name is Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that there's an enemy lurking, prowling like a roaring lion, seeking, searching who he may devour. But there's a savior that is risen. And that's the message that we are saying. So the title this morning, again, is the answer is longevity, because I want to encourage us as a household of faith. I want to remind us of what it is we're doing, because everything's exciting at first. I love to play golf. And most of the time, I like the first hole. It's about hole number 12, sometimes 10, sometimes hole number one, first shot. I don't like the game of golf anymore. <laughs> but there's an amazing power that's wrapped around golf. Because somewhere in that four-hour time span, you're going to hit the right shot. You're only going to hit one. But it's going to convince you to go pay money to do it again and bear the frustration. Why? Because you got a glimmer of hope that you can play the game. But there's a saying I always have in golf. When I get off that tee box, strong, that first tee, I always tell myself it's not how you start. It's how you finish. It's how you finish. And that's the purpose of this message this morning. It's not about how we start, because everything's exciting at first, but it's how we finish. And I believe that the word of God still says that the church will be more than conquerors because of the love of God that he shows over us. I, I still believe in the word of God where it tells us that we are the head and not the tail, the first and not the last. I also b still believe in the word of God when Jesus reminds us that we'll have trials and troubles in this life, but be of good cheer because he's overcome it all. He has overcome it all. And even though we have to walk through and things may be stretching us, things may be pushing against us, it doesn't change Jesus. So with that being said, the first thing I want to remind you of this morning is the, the, the power of understanding the call of God. Understanding the call. In God's hands, according to Matthew chapter 13, and we won't go into all of it this morning, but in Matthew 13, it reminds us that in God's hands, we are the seed and this world is his field. Matthew 13, verse 37, Jesus replied, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. Everybody say good seed. Verse 38 says, the, the field is the world and the good seed represents the good people of the kingdom. He says, you are my seed and I'm putting into this earth so that you can produce of harvest so that you can be a part of reaping the harvest. Some of us plant, some of us water, some of us reap. We are reaping the harvest today of seeds that have been planted before us. We are reaping the harvest today of seed that has been watered before us. Because somebody went before us and modeled an example. Somebody went before us that understood the call of God, that understood that seed always produces its own kind. Now, many of you, you like to have your, your, your gardens. Some of them are small, some of them are larger. And... You know, I'm really not the farmer type, but what I do know is this. I can't plant corn seed and expect to get green beans. It doesn't work. When I plant corn, I can expect corn. When I plant green beans, I can, I can plant green beans. One thing I learned with having two grandfathers that, that like to do farming was that farmers don't always look at the now. They're focused on the future. They're, 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 they understand what they have to do now. They understand the labor that has to go into now. They understand the work that has to go into now. Everybody say now. They understand the seed that has to be sown now. They understand the prep work that has to take place now. But they're not doing all of that for now. They're doing it because they have a glimpse in their mind's eyes of what that seed will produce in the future. So as we focus on the future and we understand it's not what, what, what we do now is important, but the focus is what it's going to produce in our future. The focus is what the seed will represent. It represents souls. It represents families. It represents children. Amen? 
Seed always goes through a dying process when it's placed in the ground. But sooner or later, with the right amount of nourishment, with the right amount of sunlight, with the right amount of rain, with the right amount of nourishment, this seed will start to push through the soil. And if the farmer doesn't give up on the seed, if the farmer doesn't lose sight of the seed that's covered under dirt, if he doesn't lose sight of that that he's already released, and he continues to nourishment even when he can't see the natural result, he understands that every time he fertilizes, every time he waters, every time he tends that seed that he really can't even see any longer, but he knows that it's about to produce something. He understands the purpose of the seed to begin with. When we understand the calling that God has placed on the church, and it is to disciple, it is to train, and it is to preach the gospel message, every single time we do it, we're sowing seed. There was seed sown yesterday in this parking lot that was just seed. But the More Heritage Fellowship shows up and represents what the seed can produce. We'll see a harvest. When that offering plate went by this morning and some of you sowed financial seed into focus on the future, you released the seed. Now you cover it in prayer. Now you remind yourself of what that seed can produce, and it can produce a harvest. Amen? Does anybody believe that? I have, I have a family friend um, growing up. He was a, a friend of our family. And this guy, was, this guy was an amazing entrepreneur. Anybody ever met an, just an entrepreneur? Like they can, you know. They can turn, sell ice cubes and make a million dollars off of frozen water. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this guy, he could take anything, and, and he just had the ability. He had vision like nobody had ever seen before. And years ago, he went down to the southwest Florida area, somewhere right around Naples, and he bought a small piece of land. And he came back, and he spent, he spent like 10 grand on this piece of land. And people came back and said, man, you just wasted money. You just threw away $10,000. And he kept saying, no, I didn't. And he just let it sit. And he let it sit. And he let it sit. When he was walking through that land, he noticed that there was some sprouts in these little palm trees. And he just let it sit. And eventually, all those palm trees grew to be bigger palm trees. And he began to sell palm trees. And he made over $2 million when everybody told him he was a fool. Why? He wasn't focused on now. He could see that that land had the opportunity to produce something for his future. That happens in our natural world all the time. It may not happen to you, but it happens. As a household of faith, we have to constantly remind ourselves of what we're doing now. Everybody say now. now. But it's just, we got to have the glimpse of what it can produce in the future. We don't want to just paint walls in a children's wings to say, wow, look at how pretty we can paint. We want to create this atmosphere that children want to run to the house of the Lord. And when they get here, there will be seed planted in their heart that will raise up the next preacher that will raise up the next businessman, businesswoman, the next doctor, the next lawyer, the next president of the United States. Spirit-filled believer. Everybody say now. now. We have to understand the call of God now. The second thing is we also have to remind ourselves that when we are staying committed to the service, the answer is in longevity. Why? Because God always has an opportunity for us. God always has an opportunity for you. We read 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. Verse 11, Timothy says this, And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. So verses 9 and 10, he's talking about the good news. Verses 9 and 10, he's talking about what Jesus did. And the example that, and the picture that Jesus painted. 
And then he says, then God chose me. Everybody say me. Timothy realized that there had been presented an opportunity of purpose for him to preach this gospel message. And he had enough faith to believe that if he would preach it, you know, the Bible calls preaching foolishness <laughs> through the foolishness of preaching. Some of you say, I, I know, Pastor, we hear you all the time. But we stand up here to declare words of the word of God, also that it'll pr produce a harvest of believers so that it will encourage us in our journey of life. In spite of opposition, in spite of moments of stretching, in spite of moments of change in Timothy's life, there was one thing that always stood true. He knew the opportunity that God had presented him, and he knew if he stayed true to the opportunity that the plan of God would unfold in his life. You know, they say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing you've always done and expect different results. Ha uh ha. -huh. We do that so often. We, 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 like the children of Israel, we just begin to walk in circles and we miss opportunity. We just wander in the wilderness. We just move in circles and we, and, and, and we miss opportunities. I told you last week, every time God calls us to do something, it will stretch us. Amen? It will constantly stretch us. I don't ever want us to be the people of faith that just move in circles. I don't ever want us to be the idle church that just becomes satisfied with what we have. Why? Because as long as there's breath in our lungs until that trumpet sounds, until the dead in Christ rises, until it is no more, there is somebody that needs to know Jesus. Amen. There's a child to disciple. There's a person to serve. There's somebody to bring the gospel message to. God always has an opportunity for you. One of my favorite sayings, opportunities of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Opportunities of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. God always presents opportunity. And we have to seize the moment. Amen? I stand here today, I told you guys last week, Nicole and I, as your pastors, as your leaders, we will never ask you to do anything that we're not willing to do ourselves. I, I have been stretched, but I've responded. There's times that God wanted to stretch me, and I didn't respond, and I missed it. Hopefully you only do that a couple times, and then you start to learn. You know, I grew up the old school way. My grandfather, the way he taught me about electricity was take this screwdriver and stick it in that socket. You won't do it again. I may have done it two or three times. But I've had opportunities at times and I've missed it. But what I found is God always has that opportunity. I don't want us to ever miss an opportunity when God says now. Everybody say now. When God says now, we engage. The third thing is this. We have to remain faithful where God puts us. Everybody say faithful. You hear me say all the time, we do serve the faithful God. He's always there for us. We have to have confidence that what we are doing, that God has asked us to do it. You have to have confidence that what you are doing, it's something that God has asked you to do. God will oftentimes put us in unfamiliar territory. He will oftentimes ask us to do something big that takes great faith. All he's trying to do is to stretch us. If you can do it on your own, it's probably not a God thing. If you can do it all by yourself, let me help you in your prayer life. Stop asking him if it's him because it's probably not. His word says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we may ever ask or think according to the power that works within us, which means if we can think it, he can supersede it. He can do far beyond that. He can go above and beyond that. God always wants to stretch. I wish I had a different answer. But every time I read the word, I see where his people that were obedient to his calling was always stretched. 
I see where, his, where he was always asking his church to do something. Why? Because that's when he gets the glory. When it doesn't make sense in the natural realm, that's when he gets the glory. And in order to do that big thing, you've got to make God your source. I love the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. Um, it, it's labeled in my Bible as wisdom from the Lord. How many of you want wisdom from the Lord? Amen. Listen to the words. Jeremiah said it this way. Wisdom from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But everybody say, but. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Those who have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Your source of supply, my friend, has to be in God. Your source of supply has to be in God. He's, Jeremiah says the wisdom of the Lord is this. He declares that those who put their trust and faith in man, you're going to die in a drought. You have no hope for the future. But those who put their faith and their hope and their trust in the Lord, they are the ones that are like trees, not just any tree, but a tree that runs down the riverbank, their roots go so deep that there's always living water running through the tree. And so therefore it always has leaves and it's always producing what it was designed to produce. I don't want to just be a tree. I want to be a tree that is always receiving the nourishment from the Holy Spirit, the nourishment of the living water, because when, when hell shows up at my house, that's when I have the power to square my shoulders. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by spirit of living God. When we try to do it all in ourselves, when we try to respond to the things of God just in our own natural abilities and what we can see man producing, we're missing the opportunity that God has for us because we are not being faithful to who he is. I still believe we serve a God that is able to blow our mind. I still believe we serve a God that is able to do things far beyond our imagination. Yesterday was a perfect example of that. It started out as an opportunity for a few motorcyclists to get together and go on a ride to try to be a blessing. It grew to this big event where we had so many of you out here surrounded by, everybody was surrounded by Heritage Fellowship t-shirts. We were showing the love of Christ and all of a sudden not only were we a blessing to a family, but we also planted seed and said that Heritage Fellowship is not about being a quiet church with locked doors and their lights turned off on the corner of the two main thoroughfares of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but we're going to be about the father's business. We're going to share the good news of the gospel. We're going to clothe the naked. We're going to feed the hungry and we're going to preach the gospel and we're going to reap the harvest because we're not here to set idle. God did not give us this position. There's some of you that sold land and cars and everything else so that you could sit in this building and I have enough faith to stand and declare this morning. I didn't plan on preaching like this, but I'm going to tell you, I have enough to, faith to stand and believe that the God that gave us a thousand seats is the God that will bring us a thousand souls to put in these seats that we can disciple. If that means we got to paint a wall purple, we'll paint it purple. If that means we got to set up on a parking lot, we'll set up on a parking lot. If I've got to ride a Harley, I'll ride. I don't care what I got to do. I'll share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll show the love of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to set idle for somebody else to die and go to hell because a church has taken up a piece of property property in a land in a beautiful city that God has given us the pinnacle to be the light and love of the gospel. Thank you. Be seated. I have an urgency. I have an urgency. I have an urgency. An urgency. Jesus is alive. If we can minister to a child, we can minister to a family. 
That's the reality. If we can minister to a child, we'll minister to a family. We'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. We're going to trust and obey. I feel the presence of the Lord in this house. We're going we're gonna to trust. We're going to obey. Just stay right there with me, Miss Sandra, because I'm... Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul says this, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. And not without results, for I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. Oh, we love to read the stories of Paul. Paul says, that that the Lord has favored me with is because I worked harder with everybody else and he showed me grace through it. Listen, some of you are tired. Don't grow weary while doing good. In due season, in due season, in due season, you'll reap everything, everything. There's some seed that I've sown that I haven't seen the harvest on yet, but it's coming. It's coming. There's some prayers that I prayed that I haven't seen answers to yet, but it's coming. Paul says my longevity and who I am, it's because of the grace of God. It's because of his grace. And he showed some special favor on me. Stand with me all across this house. We have to trust and obey. Everybody say obey. Stay the course. God's placed a big dream. He's given a big vision. But he's the one. He's the one that will show us grace if we'll respond in faith. There's so much in that little passage there, 1 Corinthians, from Paul. I mean, think of what he had to do at times that didn't make sense to nobody else. But he stepped out in faith and God favored him and showed grace upon him. Has anybody ever heard the name Edward Kimball? Probably not. I'd never heard the name. Probably many of you have not. Edward Kimball is not a famous person. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was a children's worker. And when I read this story about this gentleman, it told about his passion of how he would give of his own finances all so that he could always minister to the children that God placed in his life at his church. And there was this boy in his class and this boy just never seemed to engage wholeheartedly. And Edward would pray and he would pray for this boy. And he just wouldn't. He'd give the salvation message. And he'd think, this is going to be the day. And the boy would just sit there idle. And Edward was praying one day and he was walking down the street. And he passed by the local shoe store. And as he passed by that shoe store, he looked in and he saw that young man in the shoe store. He saw the young man picking up boxes and carrying them to the back room. And and, and Edward walked by and he felt the Holy Spirit say, go back and talk to him. He thought, no, this this little kid's trying to make a quarter right now. He He doesn't want to talk to me. I'll talk to him on Sunday. Continued to walk down the street and the Holy Spirit kept convicting him. And so he finally responded in faith and he goes back and he walks in the shoe store and he and he calls this little boy over the little boy's name was Dwight he says Dwight it's, it's me Mr. Kimball from from church and he began to sit there and talk to him and he said that day the story of Edward Kimball is that that day he led Dwight L. Moody to the Lord You don't know the name Edward Kimball, 
Many of you said, wow, because you know Dwight L. Moody, a famous preacher of the gospel. Well, let me show you how Edward's faith and passion for one young man, the impact that it makes. Edward Kimball, that nobody knows his name, led Dwight L. Moody to the Lord. Dwight L. Moody was preaching a revival and a gentleman by the name of John W. Chapman came and accepted Christ. John W. Chapman was preaching a revival in which another gentleman by the name of Billy Sunday came to know Christ as his savior. Billy Sunday was preaching and there was a gentleman in the audience, a young guy by the name of Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham, through the ministry of Billy Sunday, came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Mordecai Ham was preaching, and there was a young man in that audience by the name of Billy Graham that came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Has anybody ever heard of Billy Graham? I think you have. Nobody knows Edward Kimball, but everybody knows Billy Graham. All because somebody believed enough in a child by the name of Dwight L. Moody before he was ever famous, stocking shoe boxes in a shoe store, refused to give up on him. The answer is longevity. Stay the course. We, were, we understand what God has called us to. We understand what God has placed before us. But we've got to be faithful. We've got to be faithful in responding.